Mr. Keith Chua, trustee of Mrs. Lee Chung Wan Trust Fund, Mrs. Chua, and Ms. Chua. Thank you for taking time to be with us this morning. Professor Jill Mentor, our special invited speaker from King's College London. Friends and fellow social workers, a very good morning. First of all, let me express my deep appreciation to the Mrs. Lee Chung Guan Trust Fund for the generous gift of 2.37 million, which will resource the NUS Department of Social Work in partnering frontline practitioners to conduct social work research that will inform and support practitioner decision making as well as client service provision. This is indeed a timely development. Social work is increasingly being recognized as a profession that contributes solutions to the social problems that confront Singapore. With this recognition and trust given by society, comes the responsibility for us, social workers, to conduct our practice in a way that is acutely attuned to the changing needs with careful thoughts given to how helpful these solutions are. Practitioners' engagement in practice research is an integral component of accountable practice. If social workers do not engage in research, then we have to rely on other professions to generate knowledge for us, something that we have been doing for a long time. On the other hand, we are mindful not to overly alleviate the status of research findings such, such that they encroach on professional autonomy or override practice instincts. Instead, research evidence and practice wisdom should build on each other to form knowledge that guide us to be critical thinkers in program planning, resource planning, program design, training of social workers, and policy formulation. The Mrs. Lee Chung Guan Endowed Research Fund is carefully governed by a steering committee that charts the overall direction of the funds and ensures the relevance and long-term impact of the projects. The committee approves research budgets and the use of the funds. The selection committee, on the other hand, consists of field and research experts who will assess the research proposals submitted by applicants. The selection committee is supported by a resource panel which consists of service providers, service users, that is our clients, and policy specialists from respective fields to comment on the relevance and feasibility of the research project in question. In addition to feasibility, potential impact, possibility of being translated into practice, as well as training or teaching materials, adherence to ethical principle in research practice is another critical evaluation criterion to which the selection committee pays keen attention. Consolidating the evaluation by research and field experts, the selection committee puts forward the shortlisted projects to the steering committee, which will make the final decision on the choice of awardees and the allocation of research funds. Depending on the viability and impact of the projects, successful applicants can expect to receive funding that ranges from 20 to 30,000 for each practice research project, which has to be completed within three years. The first call of applications for the funds will be announced in May 2008. 2018. I'm sorry, May 2018. Applicants must be practicing social workers with a keen interest to do practice research. 
they will also have to secure endorsement and support from their employers. Successful applicants will be matched with researchers from the NUS Department of Social Work to partner them as investigators for the research projects. The uniqueness of this research grant is that it requires the practitioner research team, practitioner researcher team, to engage relevant stakeholders in the research process, which our president has mentioned, including the conceptualization, implementation, analysis, and eventually the utilization of research findings. From now to next May, when the first call for application will be announced, the Mrs. Lee Chung Guan Endowed Research Fund will organize two public lectures to raise the awareness of social work practice research, as well as engage practitioners to start thinking of different creative research ideas that can contribute to the quality of our practice. Even simple ideas, as long as they are ethically sound. The public lectures will build up to a National Social Work Practice Research Conference in next May. Just as our president, Professor Tan Cho Chuan, has mentioned, the research expertise of faculty members in the Department of Social Work positions us strategically to complement practitioners' grounded experience in conducting practice research. Indeed, in addition to research expertise, strong bonds between the two are vital to the achievement of the donor's mission in conducting impactful practice research. And I believe such strong bonds do exist between us and our alumni, many of whom are social workers in all fields of practice and seated here this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited about the potential collaboration between us in the days ahead. On that note, we very much look forward to receiving your applications when the calls open next May. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Goh. We will now proceed with the dialogue session. Please join me in welcoming back Professor Jill Mantorp. She will be joined by Associate Professor Corinne Goh, who held several key appointments at the previous Ministry of Community Development, Youth and Sports, before joining the Social Work Department as an Associate Professor of the Practice Track, and Dr. Crystal Lim, a Master Medical Social Worker at Singapore General Hospital, who has a PhD in Social Work and Master of Arts in Bioethics from University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Rosalind Au, who was our recent past head of department and has many years of experience working with low-income families in Singapore, will be chairing the session. Dr. Au, please. Good morning, everybody. So pleased to see that there are still so many people around after the tea break. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't want to spend a lot of time doing the introduction. Uh, as you know, I'm Rosalind Au. I think many of you already know me. Um, um, Professor Mantrop, which you have already heard earlier this morning. Um, Corinne, whom everybody should know in this room. <laughs> if you don't, all right, read her profile that somebody had kindly put together for us. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time going through that. And Crystal, I think uh, those of you in the medical and healthcare services will know her well. But for the rest of us, uh, please read her profile. She's the master. Um, MSW at the Singapore General Hospital and has many uh, years of work experience as well as um, a PhD, I think, from Pittsburgh. So um, what we want to do during the dialogue session today is I think primarily for my colleagues in the panel to um, comment and respond on uh, Jew's talk earlier this morning um, with reference to the local context. And also for everyone here to think about what you would like to say about the fund, the objectives, and how you are going to th think about using this fund in your own practice research in the future. Because what we want to do is to encourage people to think about what they can do um, in using this fund to actually enhance their own practice. Um, you may not 
uh, have to confine yourself to actually thinking about like evaluating your own practice to make it better. Maybe you have some ideas about some new, but small um, issues that you have confront <coughs> that has been confronting you in your work, and you don't really have the funding, the manpower to actually pursue that and um, explore that a bit further. So you can think about that as well. So without um, prolonging the introduction, I think I want to start off by just asking um, our panelists, uh, Crystal and um, Corinne, to respond to uh, Jill's talk first, and then we open it to the floor for you to um, you know, make your comments and ask for clarification about projects and whatever issues that you have in your head now about the fund and using the fund. Okay, so I'd like to invite maybe Corinne to start off first. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning, wow, I love to hear that. Well, actually, um, this research uh, grant is really very timely because as it is, I my five years in NUS here, I'm already sensing the energy being built up to do practice research, really. Some of my collaborators are here, actually, saw them. Okay, I thank you, Prof. Uh, Jill, for the very informative lecture. Um, I wanted to start off by actually asking you some questions, is that all right? Some clarification, maybe, because uh, the lecture, you may not have uh, the time to elaborate on that. I'm curious to know, uh, what is the social impact of practice research at the organisational level, and also in terms of policy enhancement development in the, in the UK setting. The uh, reason why I'm asking this is because uh, I'm thinking that while the social workers are passionate at the ground, look, asking questions, trying to figure out how best to work, uh, I wonder how can we do better in terms of translating the, the ground research at the organisational level and perhaps carry it through at the policy level. So we we'll appreciate if you could share with us uh, what, what's going on in the UK system that, that we can learn from it. Thanks. Great, thank you for that question. Um, it's a question which really lends itself to a research study saying how do issues in practice, <laughs> what Im impact have they made? But I think maybe one example is a, a good one and this is probably before practice research as a term was invented. It was uh, the concern of one social worker in London that he saw and he came across many, many cases where he thought that older people were being mistreated, neglected by their relatives. He knew through his training, and we're talking about somebody in the 1970s, he knew through his training that there was such a thing as child maltreatment, but he'd never heard of it referred to in relation to other people particularly older people. And so he got in contact um, with the, a charitable organization. He wrote up the cases that he found in a very obscure part of London called Enfield, which is not the center of anywhere. But he came across cases. He put an advert in our local social work uh, magazine that used to come in a plastic wrapper on everybody's desk in the 1970s. He put a letter in and asked for people to send them to send him examples of cases. And he got together a number of cases and he published a very small book, not with an academic publish publisher and not with any university backing, and it was called Old Age Abuse. And that, I think, was the start of our realisation in England and the UK that there was such a thing as the mistreatment and neglect of older people, that it wasn't confined to children. I think that's a good example of practice research. Um, it would have been great if the academics had suddenly realized uh, that this was going on. They did very quickly. A geriatrician, a nurse, and a social worker read that book and started to do work and research on that area. But to me, the telling example of that is that he thought about his cases, and he thought in a way that was um, horizontal thinking. Could I apply what I've learned from child protection child safeguarding to this other area. Does it really exist or is it only happening in Enfield that um, people are being not so nice as they could be? 
um, and he thought long and hard. His name is Mervyn Eastman. He's still around this time. Um, he's now retired, of course, and he got to be the director of his local social services department. But I think he made a big difference in drawing his pr practice into research, into policy, and probably in changing the way that social workers nowadays in England think when they see something and they have an instinct that um, things are not right, that perhaps this is a case where they can make a difference to the quality of somebody's life. So that, I think, is hopefully the sort of example you're thinking about. Yeah, he, good for Mervyn. He did a lot, um, and uh, he's a really nice man. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jill. Um, I suppose for us as academics, maybe sometimes, you know, our idea about social impact is more about indicators. You know, like, what is it exactly, you know? Uh, how do we exactly look at, um, you know, what makes, you know, the social impact, I guess? Uh, maybe, Crystal, you'd like to... I just, um, well, I'm really excited about this fund, and, um, but I just want to um, ask you, how was the initial experience like in the United Kingdom when, when, um, when there was this emphasis on to practice research? Um, was there more, um, particularly with regard to the uh, practitioners, the social work practice practitioners, was there more apprehension? Was there enthusiasm? Um, because I'm just uh, wondering how perhaps that may mirror, if any at all, um, our likely experience ahead. Yeah. So we've been involved in a fund which was very, very small and worked in the Children's Workforce Development Council um, where practitioners teamed up with academics. It was very small in comparison to this. Every social worker is different. Everybody knows that. They've all got different DNA and some people will want to do big studies, some people will want to do very small studies, some people will do something we don't think is a study, um, it's very variable. <laughs> so, <laughs> and some people will just like to look at data, um, because believe it or not, some social workers can manage numbers. Um, <laughs> so that depends. The people, but I suppose one of the things that I hope this will do is make the profession more receptive to research so that it will participate in research. Social workers are not only perhaps doing research, but they have to help researchers. We do this a number of ways in where I work. We give everybody who takes part in one of our studies a certificate of participation in research so that it counts towards their continuing professional development. And in our country, you have to do 40 hours of um, CPD every year as a social worker. So one hour of one interview will help you do that. But we think it's really important for people to respond to research as well as carry it out. Not everybody wants to do research, but a good interview with somebody who's reflective about what they do. A good survey completed with somebody who can tell us that actually most of the time they spend uh, driving rather than seeing clients uh, is very valuable information. So I think it's really important not always to see everybody doing research, but enabling people to say that my hour that I spend talking to a researcher, filling in a form, uh, doing, uh, uh, answering a vignette, um, taking part in a focus group is time well spent um, and not a waste of time. Because there is that pressure in social work, isn't there, that if you're not on the phone, if you're not seeing people, it can't be work. But actually, taking part in a group discussion is very valuable. So again, I think that's part of the capacity building that this fund will do, is to say to people, your experience is so important for research. Um, don't negate that. Yeah, thank you, um, Corinne, Crystal, and Jill. We'll come back to you again later. But now I want to open the uh, discussion to the floor. I think I really like what you said about social workers are natural researchers. Because we, um, you know, as social workers, you're in touch with reality, with the uh, daily living of the people that you work with. Um, you have access to information that other people are not privy to. and. Um, you know, you in your in the course of your work, you have earned the trust of the people that you work with, all the different stakeholders and all that. So I'm going to open the floor to you now to let you ask any question you like about research in social work, 
practice research and whatever you have in your head as a result of your own experience. So please um, introduce yourself, tell us your name and uh, which agency you're from and what um, you know you would like to hear from the panel. Uh, please use the mic, thank you. You can ask about the fun too, by the way. <laughs> Yes. Hi, my name is Victor. I'm a social worker at Issue Community Hospital. Um, sorry, is this probably a quite a, a basic level question, uh, but since we're talking about practice research, oftentimes when as a, at, at the ground when I, I have a question, first thing I want to do uh, is to look at the literature. Um, but as uh, at, on the ground, we don't usually have access to all the journals. I Google, and Google usually turns up the journals from 1970s, 1980s that are already public access. So that's one, one practical thing I, I face. I'm wondering, uh, I understand that uh, when I try to access NUS database, a bit hard, like even as an alumni, it's, it's quite hard to get uh, the full range. It's different when, when if I'm a student or uh, doing some, something research with NUS, I have the full access. So I can do a very quick uh, literature review and find out what's available and what's not, whether this topic is worth doing or not. Uh, sometimes in discussions, we can just quickly find out. So I'm just wondering uh, that if that's accessible to us uh, through the association or through some, some, some other channel, that will greatly facilitate uh, the thinking of, uh, of research questions. So I'm, I, I don't have an answer. I, I don't know whether this has been addressed before, so I'm just wondering, uh, especially what the department thinks of this. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Victor. That's uh, actually a very real challenge for almost everyone that we spoke with. Um, I think it's a systems issue, institutional issue. Um, we probably have to uh, look at it. Um, maybe through the grant, people can get access, you know, because they are working with us in the department, but. I mean, for practitioners, we will probably have to, um, you know, see what we can do, um, you know, with this systems issue. But what I like to do at this point as chair can is add, to ask can you I just how add, add to that, uh. um, and I, which is why this fund is really something um, is really beneficial and exciting because you get to collaborate with the faculty. And I believe the faculty understands our constraints. And much as you want to provide them a better um, scope of the problem. Um, but I, I, I just, I'm just thinking that the preliminary discussion could uh, perhaps even help you access the information. Because as a practitioner, you have limited. It's just like when I came back from Pittsburgh, I still had access as today. It was wonderful. And when that died, so did my intellectual mind. It almost perished. <laughs> and, and, and so, and it helped that I, was t I began teaching in NUS Duke, and then I have access. So this is really a systems problem, um, which is why you know um, this uh, Mrs. Lee Chung Guan Research uh, Fund uh, with the collaboration of the faculty will help. Yeah. You want to ask a question? Because yeah, I, oh, okay. I kind of uh, realized that yeah, NCSS does provide that facility for journal search and all that. Anyone from NCSS who would like to comment so that the, the sector knows about the resources, <laughs> even at the ground, the first cut, you know, about getting some information. I'm sure NUS will have a lot more uh, kind of good journals that we could dig up from, but I'm at the ground level, you know. Just a quick comment. Yep. Nobody is more flattered than an academic by having somebody who wants to read your article. <laughs> <laughs> and such is the um, global reach that if I get a request from somebody in Alabama, Australia, um, the Antarctic, uh, for my article, I will send them one. So never, I think one of the things that social workers are quite good at is asking for things um, for their clients, but ask for yourselves. If you see an article and it's behind a paywall, uh, just ask the author. They will be delighted and to read it. As, apart from your, their mother, you will be the only person probably to have, <laughs> to have read that article. So 
So please don't hesitate to ask. The second is to say that in the UK, because of our research assessment exercise, all our articles are now going to be available free online. And I think if the UK does that, um, other places will follow. And um, third point is to researchers, sometimes just when you have written an article, also write a report um, which is behind, has no paywall. Um, it will get read and will get cited as well. So I think those are three practical strategies uh, for answering your question and remembering that people do love to be asked to send you their article. <laughs> Thank you, Ju. Actually, I was going to ask her what, what they do in the UK with this problem. NCSS, please. Yes. Thank you, Corinne. Um, so NCSS, if you're a member of uh, the National Council of Social Service, you can go into the VWO corner and you get access to all the database. We are on ProQuest, actually. Or you can go to gatherhere.com. Um, and Gather Here is a resource hub for all um, social workers or anyone in the social service agencies who are members of um, NCSS. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Ross. Any other comments? <coughs> um, I'm Isabel. I'm the secretariat for the fund. I just wanted to let you know that we are also running clinics in the last quarter of this year and the first quarter of next year. And that's also the time for you to come and talk to Professor Yen Shaw about your potential research project and get guidance. There will be about six clinics. So we will please sign up and then come and see Professor Yen Shaw. Thank you. There was somebody else from the floor who wanted to make a comment on this issue about um, journal articles and access. Uh, hi, good morning. I'm Martin from uh, Care Corner. It's not about journal articles, but uh, uh, my comment or the question is from now till next year, May, while we put in our applications, what can we do to enhance or raise the level of interest in practice research in our organizations. So I'm, I'm just curious how UK does it. Thank you. I think um, asking the academics to come and work in the organization is good. Maybe not in a formal lecture sense, but to problem solving, case discussions, those sort of approaches um, and asking the academics not to come with a set title, but really to do some exploration and facilitation of events is often what we find helpful. Um, I think in the UK, we um, not everybody is good at this. Some people like to stay in what we would call an ivory tower. So I don't want you to think the UK is, is fantastic. Um, it, we're not fantastic, um, but we do recognize that for practice research, um, and research to practice are interlinked and we must do our, our best to communicate what public money is being spent on um, research, uh, philanthropic money is being spell, spent on research to make a difference in people's lives. And also because it is much better to work um, with some confidence that um, the slightly crazy thing you're suggesting is done has an evidence base. So, for example, um, we have some fantastic randomized control trials now about group work, about memory stimulation, which is the only answer to helping people with dementia. No drug on the planet has the effect of working in a group and doing structured reminiscence work. But for anybody else, that appears a bit soft and fluffy. So we, as practitioners, we need to have that evidence base because resources and um, so on get diverted to other sectors. So in many ways, practitioners will benefit from this. Um, they're probably doing it anyway, but to arm them with the shield of um, evidence it works very well, I think. In the UK, we have straightened times at the moment. We have what we call austerity. So it's even more important in the UK for people to argue that what works has to be cost effective. And that, I suppose, is something that we've not mentioned today, is about how economics needs to fill in, needs to be part of studies, I think. We need to know what things cost in order to work out whether they're cost effective. Because things can be terribly effective, but they can be unaffordable. And we need to be able to, in all research, measure the impact um, in cost terms as well. 
Social workers know that. They know the difference that income and finance makes to the lives of their service users. So I think they should be very receptive to taking on board that costs are important. They're not the only thing, but without them we can't manage to do to make research compelling. Yeah, I think some of my colleagues here are not speaking out, but I will speak on their behalf. This is a very common question I kind of like, when I interact with the social workers at the ground, the struggles they face in carrying out practice research is that whether the management endorses it as part of the, the load, workload allocation, uh, because sometimes, you know, in social practice, when there's a fire, you have to put out a fire, you know what I mean? That a case in, in dire straits, we have to go in and help the client resolve the crisis. And therefore, most times, research takes a back seat. Right. So I see my friends at the ground struggling with um, doing it officially in the agency, getting that recognition, uh, and then grappling with um, ground practice. So perhaps you could share with us, um, in the UK system, any wisdom about how we should handle this tension at the ground with the organization? Thank you. I do think that having that necessity in UK social work for people to do 40 hours continuing professional development has helped. And I don't know how much you have to do here, but um, it may not be as... Hmm? 80 hours. So even more chance to do research then. <laughs> that is a long period of time. Yes. No, um, no, a year. All right. Mm, yes, so that is one example. I think for academics as well, it's also persuading managers, rather than the practitioners persuading managers, it's our role to perhaps produce, as we would say, the rabbit out of the hat, that what managers might like to have is a solution, have they heard about this, do they know about that, not necessarily a solution to their problems, but assisting them to recognise what are the issues ahead. And academics and researchers are often in touch with policymakers more than managers um, and can bring that new perspective, can tell them what's coming ahead um, and therefore get the, the value of research. Researchers can also help managers. Managers are probably understudied. If you want to do a research topic, what about managers? They are crucial, aren't they, to the work of frontline practitioners, except that we often... Um, love to hate them and hate them um, in, in many ways. They are the problem. Um, they take a lot on. The work of a social work manager is probably understudied. Uh, what makes a good manager and how do you define what good looks like? So I think in a way it's drawing managers in rather than always having to argue the case. And some of the best studies I've done have been with managers uh, because they've wanted the chance to tell the story of what it's like to be a manager. It sounds lovely, doesn't it? I'm a manager, Everything does. everybody does what I say. Um, not in social work. Um, so, <laughs> probably not in most professions, but certainly not in social work. How do you manage that? How do you manage that um, way in which you went into social work to deal with clients and individuals and you're dealing with paperwork all the time? Um, so difficult jobs to do and I think we need to know more about social work managers because they represent the profession within the employing organisation. I, I thought to just also share from my personal experience, I mean in terms of do I have, um, I have like 0.2 FTE for research, so you say wow Crystal you're so lucky you have protected time and it's on a Friday, I've learned to block out my Fridays and I try to be territorial about it, I haven't been successful. <laughs> so, so um, I, and, I, and I believe it's important to um, be willing to use some personal time for that. Uh, of course, I hope for the situation to improve, but all I mean to say is, it's really the passion that drives us, and um, we have to start somewhere. And I, um, I do put uh, research into my practice. While it is difficult, but I can see that when I get the study outcomes, you'll be, um, you'll be full of potential, especially in terms of policy change, funding and all. Yeah. I just want to add on to what Prof G said about um, 
getting the managers involved. I would like to propose, even at a higher level, getting the organisational involved. I mean, all organisations in, in our country, social service sector, you go for a retreat, don't you? Staff retreat, da da da. So when you go for strategic planning exercise, put that in the agenda. Not just managerial level, I think. There are a lot of potentials to bring this um, practice research at a higher level to contribute to the overall mission and vision of your organisation. And that would be fantastic. Good morning. Uh, my name is Clemus Lim from SPD. I'd like to ask a question. Uh, would appreciate if you can advise us with this partnership between practitioners as well as researchers from anywhere. Else. Who has the uh, ownership rights? And uh, can you also help us to understand a little bit uh, what's the processes or what would the partnership looks like? Thank you. Um, do, we, do you want it from the example from UK? Or you want the IP? Yeah, I think um, as far as I know, this issue has to be agreed upon before the research begins. So at this point of time, I think IP rights will um, be uh, lodged with NUS, but people can write jointly. Because the research is actually conducted under a fund that is cited in NUS. So actually, the data is the property of NUS. But that is not to say that, you know, the agencies that work with us have no access to the data. But if you are to write, then it will have to be a joint um, uh, effort on both sides. How do they do it? Sorry? Um, I suppose I could just give one example from my personal experience. For example, we had um, a grant by the um, Singapore Children's Cancer Foundation. One of my colleagues and I actually were helping them to do a needs assessment um, survey for um, survivors of childhood cancer, what their needs are beyond you know, the treatment phase. You know? And so what we did was we helped to conceptualize the study uh, we did a questionnaire, we obtained uh, ethics approval from uh, IRB in NUS, and um, CCF actually used their funding to um, employ the research assistant to actually conduct the survey, to um, you know, contact their own um, clientele, as samples, etc. So when that was all done, uh, we did the analysis for the um, you know, for the uh, study. So uh, CCF would fund the person who key in the data in SPSS, you know, but we will run it and then we will interpret the data, right? And we will share with them. So what happens is that the um, CCF wanted a copy of the uh, original data and we, and we gave it to them because they funded the study, right? But the SPSS file is lodged in NUS because that's the intellectual property part because we did the analysis. Right? But they actually could then conduct further analysis on their own from the raw data, right? from the survey, the, the responses from the survey. So any article that we write now and a presentation that we make at um, social work conferences, etc., would have um, my colleagues, as well as uh, CCF, as joint uh, authors of the article or presenters. Does that make sense to you? I, I mean, that's the only example that I can give in our local context here. I don't know about UK, how do you all do it, Jill? I think it's an important part of the preparation of the fund to, um, to get that clarified. And obviously, all studies will be different. And some people may want to look at their employer's data, um, which cannot be passed over. Um, some people will want to collect new data. Some people want to collect no data. Um, so I think the questions of intellectual property need to be addressed. And also to have discussions with people about what it means um, and what the disadvantages and advantages of going down certain options are. So again, I think that's part of the preparation for the, for the fund. 
if you do discover the cure for the common cold, um, I'm sure <laughs> that um, the university will be more than delighted to take all the intellectual property um, that it possibly can. Um, but in so and in social work, we may not do that, but we certainly may find it appropriate to develop scales of measurement, to develop training programs that have certain uh, names and appear to have validity and credibility. Um, so I think it is an important area to talk about. And this is serious business, isn't it? It's very easy to say we're all researchers, we're all in the same boat, but the serious matters matter, but are best addressed early on so that everybody is clear about the property because um, the practitioner as a researcher will not be a student, and it's that change of status, I think, um, that is involved in this fund, about a, a equality, but also addressing each other's needs. Did you want to add any more, Crystal? Oh, so, so um, again, coming from the uh, medical social work perspective, that we have a joint multi-agency study um, about care experience, um, and so it involves um, Changi, General Hospital, SGH, Tan Tok Seng, NUS. And I'm the PI, I'm the principal investigator. Am I the most involved? Actually, no, it's actually NUS side. And it's got to do with the legal agreement um, SG, because it's using patient data and although it involves other um, institution, ah, oh, this is recorded. Otherwise, the word under use is maybe SGH is a bigger institution. They, they, they have a certain expectation, and I have to become the PI. The, the word under use is Tao Kwan. Na. <laughs> 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 Cannot erase from the video. <laughs> but, 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 but you see, you. you, you, you um, so, so it's, it's actually a SGH way of protecting pa uh, our patients' uh, data and confidentiality. So, it really um, is on a case by case basis. But I'm sure as, you know, as we have more uh, discussions and seminars to be clearer how things go. So it's not going to be a one size fits all. Yeah. Just, just to add on, actually, uh, we are the PI here. This is research is um, held at the Next Age Institute at NUS and also the Center for Social Development Asia. Uh, well, so we are actually the, the key PI, the principal PI. But, but you see, that's why this thing about collaboration, we need to have a discussion and a conversation. And because we're entering the hospital systems, there are a lot of confidentiality, sensitivity to data. So we need to work that out. But we strike the understanding that the hospitals being, having to have PIs is really structural, technical, it has to be done. We respect that. But the working understanding is that NUS will be the, the facilitator in terms of uh, how to handle the whole entire research process. Right, from data collection with all the three hospitals, we coordinate that at our level. We, we um, supervise our research assistants and we make sure that data collection is of good integrity. So from our perspective, it worked well because we hold that here and the ground people are so relieved, right? Because we relieve them of the groundwork, we do it here. But if things are not getting moving right, we will go back to the hospital and say, Crystal, you know, could you please uh, help with the data? It's not coming forth as fast as we can. So that's where we um, collaborate. So at our level, we would have the rights to the, the data of the three hospitals uh, with the data, I mean, the confidentiality issues being addressed. And, but the hospitals will have the, the access to their data base about the patients they want to further crunch their data. And publications will do joint. I think that's our agreement too. Yeah, hope that helps. So I think if you come from uh, um, smaller agencies, you won't, to, you won't have to handle so much of the legal aspects. But from the experience, it's just wonderful. I mean, this is because um, I'm, I'm quite new in coming back. But it has been a wonderful experience collaborating with NUS because really I, I, there are so many issues I'm unable to do on the ground, but they have the support to do it. Yeah. So I need to clarify. I'm the site PI, whereas they are the, 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 the overall the study belongs to them. Sorry, I just want to have a follow-up question on that. So when we earlier mentioned about the twenty to 30,000 uh, research grant, so does that mean that the research grants that we apply would go to, uh, to the universities because you all will be engaging the research assistants? Or uh, because on the agency angle, we are also spending man hours to make sure that uh, research is done properly, gathering the data and whatnot. So do we get also a certain a percentage of the grant so that it can also cover our man-hour costs. Thank you. 
Actually, we haven't received any grant yet, so we <laughs> <laughs> you need to have a look at it. But I think what happens is that we will invite um, people to submit proposals. And most of the time, proposals will also cover a budget for manpower needs. Right? I think the academics are already getting their salary, so I don't think you need to factor them into the manpower. But in terms of, like, for example, if you, um, you have a staff who's going to work say uh, 0.5 or something in this particular project for the next three months and you want to factor that into your budget that can be considered as you know part of the expenses okay so i think every proposal will look different and the selection committee will then um, look at the the uh, how should i say um, you know whether in fact the um, budget is uh, valid and whether they are you know over estimations or underestimations. We do that in NUS in any case when we submit proposals for research. Does that, does that help? Okay, thank you. Yeah, actually, I, I just want to say just one thing before we uh, close this discussion on the, um, raising research, uh, interest in research. I think there was uh, somebody was mentioning this. I just want to uh, reiterate, uh, elite, uh, reiterate what uh, Isabel said earlier about the clinics that we are going to uh, hold in the department uh, by Professor Ian Shaw. I think there are a few clinics that are going to be organized to help practitioners think about the ideas, the questions that you have in your head. All right? The clinics will be um, mainly conducted by Professor Ian Shaw. He's from the University of York. And he's actually, or he was the one of the founder members of this um, journal called Qualitative Social Work. And I expect many of us uh, in the field will be doing some form of qualitative social work, data mining uh, type of research, if at all, or um, maybe action research projects. You know, um, so uh, please do bear this in the, these clinics in mind and uh, come and sign up for them. Uh, I think he'll be here from August uh, for about uh, 10, 11 months, yeah. So, um, you know, we'll be uh, trying to uh, make use of his expertise as much as possible. So please do sign up for these clinics, um, you know, and they will help you greatly, I think, in terms of uh, thinking about and writing your proposal for um, submission to this grant. Okay. Uh, any other? Yes. Hi, my name is Yong Hao, a medical social worker from the Cancer Center, Singapore. Um, my question is actually more fund related. Um, given that the fund is limited in initial phase, and let's say in its narrow, it receive a lot of proposal. Is there a particular focus area that the fund is looking at at the beginning? And what are the priorities? Because you know, you get proposals from the medical side, from the community side, I'm pretty sure there's a certain priority that you will look at, given the limited resources we have. Maybe I can ask the head to uh, speak a little bit more about this. <laughs> Although I do have some knowledge, but you know, over time, you know, we might have refined that. Uh, Yong Hao, thanks for the question. So the priority of funds allocation um, will be decided by the steering committee. So it really depends on what kind of application we receive, and then the selection committee would have to select the shortlist. Uh, the best, most feasible ones, and then forward it to the steering committee. So they will decide how to prioritize the uh, shortlisted list of applications. Yeah. At this point of time, the steering committee has no um, explicit priority list. Yes. Mm. I think I think uh, in terms of the nature of the fund itself, um, probably you know you'll be quite safe if your proposal is uh, based on something that you can, on a topic that you can do something about after you finish your research. <laughs> All right, it's not going to be just a piece of paper, article, or a report that you're going to put on your shelf. All right. So um, if you could indicate maybe in your proposal that you know this research is going to help us to do this 
you know, if it's workable, then I think you probably stand a higher chance of uh, being noticed. Does that help? Okay. Uh, yeah, somebody else has a question. You have a question, John? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I want to um, suggest uh, that the Social Workers Association currently has uh, tea sessions. And um, if you address this to, to SASW and say you have uh, some interest in a particular topic and you want to call for a tea session, I think that would be a very good idea because then instead of limit, limiting it to a single agency, you have other social workers who will come on board and chit chat with you and then maybe we will be able to find a lot more interesting uh, practice questions to be uh, further developed for research purposes. So um, this is one point. The second point I want to uh, suggest that we think a little bit more about is this big question that always we have this research and now increasingly more difficult to understand because when you see research studies, there will be this report uh, on the methodology and the methodology is, is out of this world. And, uh, and unless there is somebody who translates it out into layman's language, it becomes very difficult to be assessed by people who are not so skillful in research and, and research areas and methodology is improving all the time. And so I think this translation work has to be done if we want the reports to be used more successfully and more widely. And so I think we need to think in this um, particular research fund whether there's some way we can help facilitate this, this um, uh, interpretation so that it's not just mothers who will read but mothers who will read and query <laughs> the research. Can I just uh, say something? I'm Alicia from the department. So I'm actually just giving a comment and also doing some publicity. Uh, next week, uh, Professor uh, Manthor has agreed to actually hold a one-day uh, workshop on practice research uh, in the department. So you do not have to wait till August. So if you have a question and you're curious about how you're going to actually uh, use it and research it in your department, we'll urge you to come and attend the workshop. It's actually in your uh, folder in the packet, so just do sign in. Thank you. Yeah, just to add on to Alicia, I think my other colleague, um, um, AP uh, Chu Hei Kiong, will be also conducting another workshop on program evaluation. All right, research has many different types. All right, so program evaluation is just one that it seems to us that the few is very interested in, right? So uh, she's going to run a workshop also under the fund, right? So please watch out for all these and then come and um, just make use of these, um, you know, uh, resources available from the department. Uh, thank you, John. Any other? Yes. Hi. Hi, my name is Yiting. Um, I used to be a practitioner in, as an MSW in hospital. Now I'm currently working as a research executive in the Social Service Research Center part of um, NUS. So, so I'm an advocate for practice research as well, but um, I just want to play a bit of the devil's advocate here, uh, asking this question. I'm just wondering whether there, be, there is any unintended consequences or things that are like potential, yeah, potential unintended cons consequences of promoting practice research. Um, so one thing I was thinking of is that, uh, like for example, like policymakers um, need to hear more, needing to hear more research and evidence from the ground, like uh, instead of, so one thing I'm thinking of is that it shouldn't replace continual feedback from the ground, which I, I believe there is now like, a good feedback loop in terms of networking sessions, but we wouldn't want a case where um, for everything to be translated into uh, more macro practices, we need a research paper backing it up because it might be very costly and time intensive as well. 
So I'm just wondering whether there's any, um, any kinds of things we unintended things that we might might not have considered, and any examples from UK for that, and how how do we um, mitigate that? Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Thinking about the unintended consequences of such a fund, I suppose that one consequence might be that people will want to go and do teaching and more research and then not work in practice anymore. <laughs> and that would be a bad idea. <laughs> but people do move on and education, research um, and other areas are enriched by people who have been in practice. Uh, not everybody in social work will want to stay in practice all of their life. Some people do, but some people don't. In England, we do have a big problem in that the average working life of a social worker is about eight years. People get burnt out, um, as, they, as we would call it. They are emotionally exhausted and their sense of personal accomplishment gets damaged by that. So social workers sometimes do need to move on. Maybe they need to move on, but they also need to come back. And perhaps one of the ways of enticing people back to social work is saying, listen to what's going on in practice. Um, you can play a part in this. So I think there are some consequences. It would be bad if nobody, who, if everybody who did a practice um, research award then left practice. That would be a, um, a difficult outcome to manage. But people do move in social work and we need to recognise that. Uh, and sometimes that's for the benefit of everybody, themselves, their clients, their colleagues and their managers. Um, so just addressing that as an unintended consequence. The other point about supposing researchers find something that's really difficult to say and very difficult to hear, uh, which is perhaps the big, the big issue, yes, social workers should do that and should find out and should say what we're doing is perhaps the, um, the approach, we're going the wrong way. I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but I'm sure there are some where social workers have thought very clearly about is this the right way that we're doing things because it's custom and practice um, and perhaps there's another way of doing that. I think perhaps one example I would give is, um, is from a long time ago, but it was the research of, a, of somebody who was associated with social work who in the UK found that parents were not allowed to visit their children who were sick in hospital because it upset the children upset the parents, of course, didn't it, that they couldn't visit them. But she found and she argued that make, allowing parents to visit the children when they were in a hospital bed, in the hospital ward, was for the benefit. But everybody else knew, so they thought, that that was a bad idea. So I think individuals can make a difference in those very, um, and that's one example, which nowadays in the UK, if you're the parent of a child in hospital, you virtually sleep on the floor next to them um, for, for a long time, and you have parents' rooms, and you're not a nuisance on the ward anymore. So that's a, a good example, isn't it, of a social work type person standing up and just saying, do you know, I don't, I don't think that's right. I can hear the children crying, I can hear their mums crying when they leave, or when they're not allowed to do. You, were, you used to be able to send a postcard. Anybody remember postcards? Uh, you used to send a postcard to your child when they were in hospital. And um, how very telling that appears to us now um, when we perhaps have to spend a lot of time with children in hospital. But that's because everybody knew that was right until one day everybody thought that maybe it wasn't. Yeah, thank you, Ju. I think the, the other point that was made just now was this question about do we need to do a practice research for everything? I mean, there are some things that we can just go ahead and do and, you know, so we, we don't have to waste time on doing this research. And I thought that's a very good question because that really helps us to think about do we really need to do this piece of research? And which is one of the reasons why I think when we ask people to submit proposals, it has to be endorsed by your agency, that the agency feels that you really need to do this. Because if that issue or problem uh, or practice of practice can be resolved without a piece of research, why not just go ahead with it, right? And I can think of so many examples, you know, of people starting new services because nobody else, including the agency that they had been working with, wanted to pick up this 
very important piece, but it may be a very small piece for a small percentage of the population that you work with. All right, so there are many um, NGOs, VWOs that have individuals who want to champion this uh, particular area of work have come out and set up their own. And we'll be very happy to, I think, you know, consider the pro a proposal to actually study the feasibility of doing this. Right? So, um, yeah, they may be this kind of unintended, um, you know, um, um, obsession with uh, practice research, but it shouldn't be, I think, if we think about it properly at the individual and the organizational level. I've just been flashed a card to say there's just one minute left for us before we break for lunch, okay? I mean, we had the five minute one, so I just ignore it. But uh, <laughs> so, can I just have one last question if there is any from the floor? No, that one minute is a real, uh, yeah. So I, I just want to um, just thank uh, my panel members here and you in particular. I think it's important for us to go back and think about the four Ps that she's been uh, talking about just now in her slide. If I remember, it's thinking about other people, you know, it's um, not just about ourselves or, you know, what we do, but the people we work with, uh, other people that may not even be in our caseload, but are important. Then the uh, second P is the pressing problem. Is it very pressing? Do we need to do it straight away? You know, so many of you in your practice might have noticed uh, issues and people that you think really, really need to be, um, you know, uh, looked at. Um, that one is puzzling. Do you have a question? You know, that's in your head, floating around, but you. Um, like I think it was Vincent who said, or is it Martin, who said that um, you, you need to find out more about this, you know, so please do, um, you know, uh, contact us. And then also, you know, um, the possibility of um, studying small areas. Sometimes it's a very big issue, but you might want to cut it down to a bite size. And so that you can actually make a difference in that specific area of work. So uh, with that, I just want to... Um, Thank Jill and Corinne and Crystal and the floor for being so active. This is one of those rare occasions where we don't have to wait forever for somebody to go to the mic and say something, you know, at a, at a public forum like this, right? And lastly, I think I just want to thank uh, Keith and Irene and Michelle for being here uh, throughout this whole morning's, um, you know, um, activities. I uh, thank you for your time and your support. And I think the time is as important to us as the financial support for the fund. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>